feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their song of sweetest praise drifts back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, oh then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Good morning, everyone. If you're visiting with us today, we'd ask it, uh, if you would mind to fill out one of these little cards that's in the, seat, the back of the seat in front of you and put that in the collection plate when it uh, is passed around. Before we pray, I'd just like to thank everyone so much for all the prayers and support they've given Dana and I through uh, my cancer treatment and everything. Everything is going very well. Prognosis is, is uh, very good for me. And we just praise God. Thank you, every, everyone, for everything. So good to see you here today. Let's pray. Our awesome Father, we're so humbled to be before you, to be called your children. We give you praise and we give you glory for everything that we have in this world, dear Lord. We pray that you just help us to put everything in perspective, to, to understand where we stand with you, where you stand with us. And we, we're so humbled to be your children, to, to have the opportunities that we have. We just pray that you bless us in our frailties and help us to understand your purpose for our lives. We pray for those of our congregation who are physically ill. We pray for Bonnie. We thank you so much for the teamers' successful pregnancy. We pray that you bless Lindsay and we just pray that you give that baby and her health through, through this time. We pray for our missionaries that are around the world, dear Lord. We pray for all the the difficulties that they have to go through. We just pray that you give them more strength and strength for their families who are back here and away from them. We just pray that you give them comfort and peace in this time. We pray for the leaders of our countries. We pray for the leaders around the world. We pray for peace around the world. We pray that your will be done and that, that the world is for you, thinking for you, making decisions. We pray for wisdom for our leaders. We pray that that uh, you bless all the decisions that are made. We pray for our church family. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for what we have here. Help us not to take it for granted. We thank you for all the love that's shown in so many different ways around here. We just pray that you bless us as a congregation. Help us to get even stronger. Help us to see the strength that we have in one another. We pray that you bless us and give us strength through the shortcomings that we have and the difficulties that we have with each other at times. We just pray for the continuing of your love. We pray that you bless us as we praise you this morning in worship and songs and sermon. We pray that everything that we do today is pleasing to you, dear God, and that we uplift each other, we praise you, and that we glorify you in all that we do. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen.
Good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. I want to welcome our visitors. We're going to start this morning's song service with number 389. <clears throat> 389. Take the name of Jesus with you. Child of sorrow and of woe, it will joy and comfort give you. Take it then where you go, precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Take the name of Jesus with her as a shield from every snare. If ten round you gather, breathe that holy name in prayer, precious name, oh how sweet, of earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet. name of Jesus, how it thrills our souls with joy, when his loving arms receive us, and his songs our tongues employ, precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven, precious name, oh how sweet, hope of earth and joy of heaven. Next song will be... Number 720, 720. After this song, we'll have the scripture reading and our prayer. 720. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to the Lord. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen, Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living, Jesus is living. Jesus is living his church. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus 
Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. He's coming back to claim his own. He's coming back to claim his own. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back to claim his own. So sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Good morning, family. I will be reading from Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Give a portion to seven, or even to eight, for you know not what disaster may happen on earth. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth, and if a tree falls in the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones and the woman and the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. In the morning sow your seed, in the evening withhold not your hand, for you do not know which will prosper, this or that, or whether both alike will be good. Light is sweet, and it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. But let him remember that the days of darkness will be many. All that comes is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. Remove vexation from your heart and put away pain from your body, for youth and the dawn of life are vanity. Let's go to our Father. <clears throat> Dear most holy, precious, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for this day that we can gather together, Father, and give honor and glory to your Son, Father. We, we thank you so much for the surprise this morning, this clean, white blanket that you, you laid out for us this morning that not only reminds us of the pureness of, your, of our Savior, Father, but that where we're living is is the ultimate place father for us in alaska father that the surprises come at every corner and father thank you for the many gifts that you've given to us father the those that are suffering health can problems father we pray that you continue to bless them and lift them and that we can help them that you place the correct physicians in their way father and Father, we pray that you help us to leave us, lay aside the, the the problems that have dragged through us with this, dragged with us through this week, Father. That we can start anew today and lay them aside and focus on your Son, Father, and the gifts and the glory that He's He's laid out for us, Father. And be with the, the brother bringing the lesson today and help him to to bring it. That in a manner that opens our hearts, Father, and our minds to, to see the love and the glory that you have waiting for us when we get to come home. And Father, we, we pray that 
as we're learning this lesson today that we can apply it in our life father and father that we can do so in a manner that is, that is pleasing to you father we we pray all these things in your son's most holy and precious name amen <clears throat> Number 679. 679. I know the Lord will find a way for me. Welcome to you if you're visiting. I take this moment just to let you know that we have a nursery downstairs, pretty much right underneath me, and it's attended. I just wanted to make that announcement. We're filling up quite well this morning, and lots of kids, and that is fantastic to see. Um, also, we still have some folks arriving, so if it is really easy for you and kind of convenient, look to your left and your right and just see if you can make a little bit more room by taking up an unoccupied seat. Thanks. Let's sing number 171. 171. The next couple of songs are going to be to start preparing our minds to take the Lord's Supper. And after we sing this song, Brother Scott Crockett's going to lead us in, a, in another song. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth, fourth verses. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of I 
Witness them to Number 343, 343, Lauren wanted this song sung before the Lord's Supper, and I was familiar with it, number 343, <clears throat> I haven't sung it in a while. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go. The way of the cross leads home. I must needs go on in the blood sprinkled way, the path that the Savior trod. If if I ever climb to the heights sublime where the soul is at home with God, the way of the cross leads home, the way of the cross leads home, it is sweet to seek my home where he waits at the open door. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to These things spake Jesus, and he lifted up his eyes into heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son may glorify thee. Even as thou gavest me authority over all flesh, that all whom thou hast given me I should give eternal life. This is life eternal, that they should know thee, the only true God, and you and he whom you have sent into the world, even Christ Jesus. I glorified thee on earth, 
having accomplished the work that thou hast given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me with thine own self, with the glory that I had with thee before the earth. Jesus prayed to be glorified and that he would glorify God. He prayed, in his prayer, he prayed for the hour has come, the hour of the cross. And in that cross, he wants to be glorified. In that cross, Jesus defeated death and brought eternal life to us. We know and we often speak of the agony of the cross. But we ought not only to remember the agony of the cross, but the great glory of the cross. The cross was Christ's finest hour. The cross was the purpose that Jesus came. He said in John 12, 27, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? But for this cause came I to this hour. It is at this hour on the cross that he bruises the head of Satan and fulfills the earliest prophecy of salvation. It is at this cross Jesus won the victory of all victories. It's because of this cross that God could say through Paul that we are more than conquerors. The cross was a glorious cross. It brought glory to Jesus as ruler over the universe, over the world, over sin, over death, over Satan. Jesus had to die for death to die. The cross brought, brought glory to Christ because it was the object that draws all men unto himself. He says in John 12, 32, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. He said this, speaking, signifying the manner of his death. The cross glorifies Jesus because it was the completion of his work. The work of Christ began before the foundation of the world. Christ had it all planned out before he created. He created Adam and Eve. And it was Christ, the seed of woman, that would bruise Satan's head. It was Christ that took care of the seed line through Noah during the, during the flood. It was Christ that gave the promise to Abraham that we would be saved by faith and not by works of law. It was by faith, or it was by Jesus that Moses brought the law to condemn sin in the flesh. Jesus sent the promise through David that his seed would rule forever in the Messiah. And that same Jesus became flesh and blood and dwelled among men. And he fulfilled all the requirements of the law for us. And then he goes to the cross. And he said there, that was John 17, 1 through 5, by the way, that we read first. And he says in verse 4 there, I glorified thee, having accomplished the work that thou gavest me to do. Jesus' cross was the climax. Jesus' cross was where he completed all of his work. Therefore, when he hangs on the cross for six hours in agony, then he says in John 19, verse 30, it is finished. That was victory. That's the victory of all victories. It's finished. He brought eternal life to mankind. Jesus' death on the cross was glorified because it's love's greatest act of obedience. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience through the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the author to all those that obey him of eternal salvation. Jesus, being 
God counted not the being on God, uh, equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant. Being made in the likeness of man, in the fashion of man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient, even unto death, yea, the death of the cross. Wherefore also God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. Jesus faces death square in the face and said with the loving obedience, Thy will be done. Not my will, but thine be done. The cross glorified Jesus because the cross is climaxed by a resurrection. God speaks to us through Paul in Romans 1. And he speaks of Christ in verse 3 and 4. He says, concerning the son who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, even Jesus Christ our Lord. The cross of Christ and his death glorifies Jesus because it was the way for him to go home to his father. In verse 5 of John 17, he says, Now, Father, glorifiest thou me with thine own self, with the glory that I had before the foundation of the world. The way of the cross leads home, which Scott just led us. The way the cross leads home. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man come to the Father but by me. The way of the cross leads home. The cross of Christ, although in all of his agony because of our sins, is the great glorious cross. So as we partake of the bread and drink of the fruit of the vine. Let's remember, that is a glorious cross, and it gave us everything that is of true eternal value. Let's pray. Great Almighty God, how we thank you for our Lord Jesus and the great sacrifice that he paid on the cross, the sacrifice of his own death, but we thank you for the great glory that came about because of that cross. Because of that cross, we live eternally with you as we are obedient to your word. As we take of this bread, let us remember the flesh, the body of Jesus that was offered up as the Lamb of God. And give you all the glory. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.
We continue our thanks, Father, because of the greatest gift in the world, your son Jesus, that you sent. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your willingness to come and to give your life and give your blood on that cross. And all the glory that it brought you and your Father and raised us from the depth of sin to the glory of all of heaven. We thank you for that blood that cleanses us. As we take of this fruit of the vine, let us consider the blood that was shed, shed for us, that we might receive glory from the glory that you received. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen. Jehovah with all your substance and with the first fruit of your increase so that your barns may be filled plentiful and your vats will overflow 
with new wine. From the beginning, there has always been a correlation between what we give to God and what he gives to us. Everything we have belongs to God. Everything we have is a gift from God. And the extent that we give back to God is the extent that he'll increase what he's given to us. This is a joyful part of our assembled worship where we have an opportunity to give to God and join hands with God in the greatest work in the world. We're fellow workers with God. He said again in Malachi 3, after he claimed that they were robbing him, he says, wherewith shall I, will a man rob God? And they said, wherewith have we robbed thee? And he said, in tithes and offerings. And then he challenges them. Bring in the whole offering into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and prove me therewith, saith Jehovah of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there will not be room to receive. God says, give it to me and I'll get He's got a bigger shovel than we have. Give it to the Lord and he gives it back to us. And in doing that, we have the opportunity to join hands with God, as I already said, in the greatest work in the world. Jesus said, Lay not up yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up yourself treasures in heaven, where moth and rust does not consume and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. And if the eye be single, thy whole body be full of light. But if the eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. And if the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is the darkness therein. No man can serve two masters. He'll love the one, hate the other, cling to the one, and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What is on our mind all day? What do we strive for? What do we think about? Where is our heart? Our heart is where our treasure is. And is our treasure laid up in heaven where it will give eternal benefits? Or is our treasure on earth? where the moth eats it and the, and the rust eats it and the thieves steal it. Who are we serving? Where are our treasures? Let's pray. Great God, we thank you for all the wonderful blessings that you give us so greatly, so abundantly. And we thank you for the opportunity you give us to have part in your work that we, through our contribution, can share in the preaching of the gospel and the salvation of souls and the edifying of the brethren and the growth of the church and your name throughout the world. Thank you for this great privilege. It's through Jesus we pray. Amen.
Please mark your, your song books at number 579. Number 579, that's going to be the song of invitation after the lesson. And before our scripture reading and lesson this morning, let's all stand and get our blood flowing and sing number 242. Stand and sing number 242. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through His beloved Son. is more than conqueror. Stand then in his great might with all his strength in due. Think to arm you for the Scripture reading will be from Psalms 90, um, verses 1 through 4. Psalms 90, verses 1 through 4. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You return man to dust and say, Return, O child, children of man, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a, as a watch in the night. Good morning. It's good to be with you today. Praise God, Creator, eternal and invisible. Praise Christ Jesus, image of the eternal, invisible. Creator. Praise the Holy Spirit who has revealed to us both creation and resurrection. Praise Christ Jesus, firstborn from the dead, firstborn of creation, our Lord, the author of life, and the hope of salvation. Moses' psalm, I don't know if you noticed in Psalm 90, that was written by Moses, but that wasn't the first thing that he wrote. The first book of Moses would be Genesis. 
And in this doxology, this praise to God that we have listened to together, in this psalm of, of Moses that Etienne read for us, and I think in the first chapters of the book of Genesis, we are faced with profound comfort that there is an eternal God who watches over us. And at the same time, we are reminded that this is an awesome God. We are left in awe of this eternal God. It's like counting the stars, which is getting harder and harder to do with the sunlight increasing. But that's okay. Come July, you can just Google how many stars, right? And so you get that number, you count the stars, and you get that number, and you know truth. And then you start to ask questions, where did they come from? Why do they shine? Why do I even care about where they came from and why they shine? I, maybe, I mean, can, someone probably knows, can you teach a monkey to count could you teach a monkey to count stars? Can you teach a monkey to ask, why do I count the stars? Why should I care? There's something, there's something special about being human and having God as our creator. But as soon as you grasp that truth that God is our creator, you're left with, with so many unanswered questions. I want to look at the declarations of Genesis chapter 1. They tell us enough. Genesis 1 tells us enough about where we came from, so we have an idea. And yet we're left with a profound mystery. Many unanswered questions. I am not going to scratch the surface of all the questions you're going to have from Genesis chapter 1 today. And let's take that as a reminder that God is our creator and that he is awesome. So Moses grew up in Egypt, and Stephen tells us that Moses was educated in all of the wisdom of the Egyptians. He would have gone to Egyptian grade school and junior high. I don't know if they called it middle school or junior high, but they went to high school. He would have gone to the Egyptian university system. He was inundated with what the Egyptians thought about their highest wisdom and where everything started. And then he, by, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, decides to publish a book. What a way to open your first book. In the beginning, God created. That word for God to the Egyptian ear would have just sounded like a lowercase God. Lowercase g in, in God. He uses a word that they were familiar with. They, they understood that there were many gods. And so Moses starts off and he says, In the beginning, God, and they would have heard God's created, and that didn't really uh, seem odd to them. However, the declaration of Moses is that there are not many gods, and that they are not feeble gods, but there is one God who brings the universe into existence by the power of his word. The fact that God alone creates would reject all of his Egyptian upbringing while simultaneously shunting any Hebrew arrogance. No Hebrew could pound his chest and say, yeah, I know who created the world because that same creator made that Hebrew. That same creator made Moses. Genesis uh, 1 verse 2 the earth was without form and void and the darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters how does Moses know that the earth was formless and void how does he know that there was darkness over the deep of the waters how does he know that this is not some uncontrolled chaos but that God is brooding and hovering over what has yet to be formed. I appreciate science very much. And science's job is to observe 
and then to draw conclusions. Was there anybody around in Genesis 1, verse 2, to observe and draw conclusions? It's not knocking science to say that science can't give you a definitive answer. But we could say the same thing about religion. Because you read Genesis 1, or you read any other creation account from another culture, and we're not told everything. You're never going to have enough information from what God tells us to explicitly answer every question about where you came from. The how we got here and the when, we should talk about those questions. But in some sense, those questions are unanswerable. The really explicit and the really specific, God, for whatever reason, hasn't given us all of the answers. We'll get into what he has given us. Psalm 103, we'll flip over there for a moment and then we'll come back to Genesis chapter 1. How does Moses know these things that science and, and religion uh, are, are just unable to give us specific, exhaustive answers on? There's something about, you know you've met a really smart person. When, or this is how you know a really smart person. They know how much they don't know. If someone is really into telling you everything that they know, if the first thing someone says to you is, yeah, I've got these credentials or I know this, but there's so much more that I don't know, well, then you're scratching at what it means to be men like David. David didn't know everything, and he says in Psalm 103, uh, verse 6 and 7, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. Now, God made a lot of things known to Moses, uh, the law and how, we sh and how the Old Testament people should live. But God also made known his, uh, our beginnings to Moses. And so David says, hey, I know a lot, but Moses knows a lot more than me. How is Moses described in, in Numbers chapter 12? Do you remember the description? He was something, the most of any man on the face of the earth. Numbers 12 tells us Moses was the most humble man in all the face of the earth. There was a moment in time when God revealed the beginnings to Moses that it was God and Moses who knew how everything started. That might make you feel pretty good about yourself. And yet there's this enduring humility to Moses, and, and this humility and this awe comes out in, in the book of, of Genesis. Moses declares that God is sufficient. He doesn't need us. He has let us know some of what we need to know, but he's kept many things back. Moses declares and he realizes how much he didn't know. I'm not saying the how and the when are unimportant. I'm saying that Genesis often gets closer to the who and the why. Moses declares the sufficiency of God. In the beginning, God created. For you visual learners, I've got the first three days mapped out here. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Moses does tell us some of how everything got here, but it's more simple and more powerful than we like to comprehend. There's a, a musical composition written by a, nam, uh, man, a man named, named Hayden, and it's called The Creation. And it really captures for me the, the emotion or the feeling of what God creating by speech would, would seem like, creating something from nothing by simply speaking. So Hayden composed this, and one of the early performances, uh, it opens up with, with this sort of uh, dark and, and there's void and there's, the music is creating this sense of, of things are swarming around and then there's this moment you call it a power C chord where it explodes and that's where God creates light and here's a newspaper description of what happened to the audience they experience something like God creating something from nothing by speaking at the moment when light broke out for the first time 
one would have said that rays darted from the composer's burning eyes. <laughs> the enchantment of the electrified Viennese was so general that the orchestra could not proceed for some minutes. It says that God spoke things into existence, and it's easy for us to let that go. But light bursting upon the scene for the first time? Imagine you're at a concert, and something so amazing happens that everyone just has to stop and say, let's take a breath, because that was incredible. Robert had mentioned that... Uh, that that, and he's right in mentioning that there's so many things vying for our attention and, and that, you know, screens and, and much of, of Hollywood and entertainment, it's just they're super good at, at getting our attention. Uh, and he's right about that. And he was also right in saying that really the things of truth demand a sort of patience from us. What God creates here in Genesis 3, uh, Genesis 1 verse 3, let there be light and there was light. Genesis 1, 6, let there be an expanse, let there be the sky. God said in verse 9, let there be waters be gathered together and, and let dry land appear. We can look at those elements of creation and we can think they're very simple. But there's a profound complexity to light and to water and to earth and to sky, but it requires a sort of patience, a sort of living amongst these elements to us, for us to draw out the true complexity and life-giving nature. I mean, if we just said, let's not have boring things in our life, well, you got to start with getting rid of water, and you got to start with getting rid of land and light and the atmosphere. How long has it been since we've stood and, and we've watched the clouds, right? And you've picked out shapes from the clouds. There's a patient complexity. God says, uh, let there be light, and light appears. And then God names the light day, and he names the darkness night. God is not at war with darkness at this moment. He, he is in control of them, and he names them. He fashions the sky, something we can't even put our hands on, and he names it. There in verse 8, and God called the expanse heaven or, or sky in the second day. Verse 9, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together. The, the Hebrew verb for that is, is mikvah. He mikvahed. If you look, if, if, I don't want to draw attention to our, our balcony sitters there, but if you look past them, we have a sort of mikvah in the baptistry. And, and speak with Joe, and he'll tell you how frustrating it is to try and gather water. We can hardly gather dozens of gallons together, right? Without keeping it heated, and without keeping it from spilling, and without keeping it from, from not being where it's supposed to be. And yet with a word, God gathers the waters. You go, you go uh, uh, north, am I right? You go north on trunk here, and there's this big... Uh, uh, gravel area and it was kind of an oxymoron as I drove past it this morning like that's the most beautiful gravel pit I've ever seen but man they have these nice uh, they have like it's not a it's not a wall but it's like a berm of rocks that's very nicely stacked and all their piles of dirt are very neat and yet what was some was the foreman just I don't know if a foreman runs a gravel pit the gravel pit guy was just was he just standing there and being like I want that pit and I want that and I want that and it happened I don't even know how to drive a backhoe. It would be impossible for me. The amount of effort that us humans have to exert to move tiny increments of these simple elements, and yet God speaks them into existence. And we haven't even gotten into verse 11, let the earth sprout vegetation, so plants, uh, grasses, plants yielding seed, and the fruit trees bearing fruit in which there is seed. Right there on the bottom, if you can see on number three there, you have your grass and you have your grain and you have your seed-bearing fruits. Probably an oversimplification. What is something that plants need that hasn't been created yet? Yeah, you need sun. I mean, I know there's light. But the point of that is that God is sustaining these things. No one can say, let's worship the life-sustaining sun because there was a time in our history in which everything was sustained by something other than the sun. And that 
thing, that person, was God. What did the Egyptians believe? What was Moses contradicting here? The Egyptians believed that matter was eternal, and the only way the gods could move around things was by magic and by saying specific words according to some other power. That the word of the gods was not enough to create and certainly not enough to guide. And yet by Moses' statement, God's word alone formed creation. God's word is the highest power. Step away from Egypt and you go to Canaan where the people would settle. The Canaanite gods were violent and they were moody and they were spiteful like me before I've had a cup of coffee. Uh, They were at war with themselves. These gods were fighting each other and out of that fighting uh, humans, I don't know how, shot out of that. But the thing about the Canaan uh, creation story of the Canaanites, they don't even have the whole thing. You get to the interesting part of the story and it's broken off. It's like getting down to Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and you're like, oh, he's going to make man, and then boom, oh, well, I guess the gods couldn't preserve their story. And so these people would grow up thinking that that the gods are at war and they're spiteful and that people just weren't worth knowing where they had come from. And yet what do we see in the beginning, these first three days? God is not at war with darkness, he's not at war with matter, and he's not at war with himself. He is at peace, and the things he make are good, and God is sufficient. Moses declares that God's word has formed the earth, but he's not done yet, because this landscape was created to be a place where love could dwell. This stage that he is creating is a stage where God will come down to fellowship with his people. And so we move on to the next three days. And we see Moses start to emphasize that God is orderly and he is filling this landscape with things that have purpose and that are very good and that are adequate for their task. Verse 14, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens. And then he gives them a purpose to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. The lights and the stars don't have some ruling influence over our fate, but they're placed there to help us measure time and to illuminate. If you can picture a stage where plays happen, it's it's the lighting is being placed to serve those who are on the stage. These things have been given a specific purpose. God goes a step further in verse 20. God said, Let the waters swarm with living creatures, sea creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. And notice what he says in verse 22. And God blessed them. The creatures of the sea and the birds that fill the air are not some accident. They're not some randomly generated thing. God has not only placed them there, but he has blessed them that they would be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Verse 24, we move to day 6. Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds. Livestock, creeping things, Beasts of the earth, according to their kind. Animals placed for a purpose and for a reason. And before we get to that final step, that highest creation of man, I want to reflect upon another uh, worldly creation story that, uh, that Moses would have been familiar with, or certainly the people of that area. Um, So we've talked about Canaan and and we've talked about Egypt, the wider expanse of Mesopotamia there. They thought that man came about by some afterthought, that the gods were doing their thing and man came across as an accident and and they were like, hey, let's make them do our, our dirty work. And if they die, big deal. What does Moses declare 
about God's highest creation. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Moses declares that God's highest creation is an accident? No, that it is very good. And that it's supposed to be created in an image that can relate to God. That can share in the work of God. Day 7, verse 31. And God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. God finishes from his work and he ponders and he reflects upon what he has created. God finished his work, but Moses' first book has only begun. And I'd like us to close by considering how this book lives on in us, uh, the church of the New Testament. The invisible God has made a visible Jesus, the firstborn of creation. And it's not that God made Jesus, because as Lauren said, where was Jesus during all of this creation? He was right there with him, creating. The word that is powerful enough to create is a word that is powerful enough to direct our lives. And far from being some accident, God is created to live on this landscape for good works in Jesus Christ. I don't know where exactly all of Moses' humility came from, uh, but some of it might have been from pondering creation and realizing how much he didn't know. So I'd like to, to tie in the invitation with what, we're, with what we've been thinking about today as, as we close Responding to the invitation of Christ to accept Christ as your Lord is to acknowledge a humility and awe before Christ as well as a, as, a, as a wonder and a hope of the great things that he has offered to us. Christ and creation. Seemingly things that in, in our time, uh, we, we think of them as far apart and yet, they are knowledge from above. This is not our own knowledge. This is something too great for us that we could not have come up with. It is revealing the unseen world to us. May Christ and may the declarations of creation be a filter for us as we test knowledge and discern what is true wisdom. And may we look to creation and may we look to Christ ultimately for the promise of fellowship in the firstborn of creation. Colossians 1.15 Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And him, in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body and the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Family, let's stand and let's sing together. Today, 
Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in life's busy way? Working for the Master, giving Him the praise. Earnest in the vineyard, honoring His laws. Faithful to His counsel, watchful for His cause. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in his work of love? to him lifting prayers above courage faithful servant in his word we see on our side forever will the Savior be who will follow Jesus who will make reply I am Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Please be seated. Before we have our closing prayer this morning, Let's close our song service with number 682. 682. <laughs> bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with love. There is only one God. There is only one King. There is only one body. That is why we can sing. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. Pray with me, please. Father in heaven, we thank you so humbly for the blessings of this great Lord's Day. Father, we know that uh, this is the day that the world celebrates the resurrection of Christ. We know that every day is a great celebration of the resurrection of Christ, which brings us our salvation. We pray that you will be with those of our number who are ill or suffering in a physical manner. Please be with Bonnie and Mark and others that I haven't mentioned that you know all too well. And please bring them healing and comfort as you see fit and be with others who may be 
suffering from an emotional or spiritual standpoint and equally need your strength and healing. We pray that you will always be with the elders and leaders of this congregation and please give them the wisdom uh, to be great leaders and stewards. Pray that you will be with us as we fellowship together today and as we proceed with further study from your word. We pray that that will bring great blessings to us as we all are trying to grow in a spiritual manner. Pray that you will be with us as we partake of this fellowship meal and bless the food and those that have prepared it. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Very glad everyone's here. We're very glad to have our visitors, especially. If you are visiting, we ask that you take the time to fill out a visitor information card. If you have any questions about the school,